Why did you leave Thais, Omer? When we were in Hayes and I was in Southall, we started meeting in somebody's house, Frank and Eileen's house, and studying the Bible, the Book of Romans, with about three or four other couples like us. And it was really something special. But why did we move to Hazemere was because Diane Keith had contact with an estate agent and they were, some in the group were looking for a house as well. And we just felt there was something in the group that we wanted to do. We didn't know what it was. There was a great expectancy of something and we could be together as great fellowship. We think that we're making a decision. Mm. But when we, uh, when we got to know people in the area in Hazemere, we found out there'd been a prayer meeting and they'd been praying for young people to come out to onto the Manor Farm estate. estate. But we mm. didn't know. We didn't know that at the time. And we, we just wanted to stay together because we were, you know, we enjoyed what we had a, mm. as a group. Yeah. Well, that's a good question because at the time I was only a girl of 13. So I didn't really have much say in it. My, my parents, mum and dad were going to move out here. Um, and I'm sure they did talk to me about it, but um, for actually having any reason for moving out, I really moved out because they were moving out. Was it scary moving to a new place? Yes, it was. It was very daunting. I was just 13 when all this came about. Um, I just moved secondary schools and was very happy in my school. I had lots of friends. They were always around, and I was always at their houses. And um, and life was good. When we moved, it was a little bit of a different story. And I found that really daunting. And I felt, I can remember feeling really out of my depth. I don't think it was very scary at all. Um... We thought of it more as an adventure. The most that most of us thought it was more of an adventure, where we were going out to all be with one another, with our friends, and we were going to a really nice place. But uh, I, most of us were younger than Frank and Eileen. They were ten years older than us, and I can always remember that Frank, when we went to look at the houses and we decided to buy them, always hoped that the houses, that his purchase of the house would fall through so that he wouldn't have to move to Hazelmere. But God had other plans and we all moved. For us, it was um, double excitement because we were starting a new life, getting married. But there was also a great sense of something new about to break in our fellowship and our uh, Bible group and our whatever was going on with us as a group, and it was really quite exciting from both aspects. So we were high. Why did you start meeting in a lounge on Sunday? So we were at two different churches, and the group of people that went to the Penn Free Methodist Church, they felt very loyal to the pastor there because... He was very good to them and they had close links with him and they were wondering about leaving the church. Was it a good idea while he was there? And um, one Sunday he rang up and he told us that he was going to be leaving the church and at the same time the group that went to Hazelmere Free Methodist Church, uh, they applied for membership at the church but we were refused on the grounds that we were too evangelistic. So there we were. Um, we didn't have a church to go to, so we talked about it, and Frank said, well, we can meet in my sitting room. So that's what we did. We said, well, OK, are you sure about this? And he said, yeah, we'll meet in my sitting room. But meanwhile, Joy had been attracting... She was like the Pied Piper. She was attracting all the children, and they used to meet in Frank's um, Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon. Yeah, for, off the estate. For, yeah. for all the kids. It was um, Sunday school, which you would call now King's, King's Kids. King's Kids, yeah. 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 What well, did you wear to the first meeting? Did you have puffy hair or red trousers? I didn't have frizzy big hair, but I did have long hair, longer, quite a bit longer, about the length your hair is. Actually, I did have hair. <laughs> 
but no red trousers. <laughs> How long was it? What, my trousers or the hair? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't down to my shoulders, it was down to my ears. All over his head. <laughs> <laughs> dear, oh dear. What was the first meeting like? Was the king's kids? So there we were. I can remember all the people who were who were at the meeting. It wasn't only the nine of us. There were a couple more people, and we got into Frank's sitting room, which was only five meters by five meters. And there was a dining room table in the corner, and a sofa, and a few other things. So it was quite cramped. And we sat on the floor, and we sat there, and we all looked at one another, and then we waited and we prayed. But we praised the Lord, didn't we? I can't really remember the first meeting specifically, but I do know that we had a piano, we had hymn book, we sung hymns. Um, anyone could say almost what they liked, but they, we called it bringing a word. So if you had something that you felt the Lord was saying to you, then you brought that. And King's Kids, we had a lot of King's Kids, or quite a few, but they were crawling around on the floor in the front of the meeting. It was very similar to our midweek meeting uh, that in that we had verses from the Bible, we prayed. We didn't sing a lot. It was fairly spiritual, open but spiritual. We'd had our first King's Kid by then, haven't we, I think? Was the Holy Spirit there? I have to say, yes, the Holy Spirit was there, as the Holy Spirit is always there uh, and here. Um, But we weren't really aware. We learnt about the Holy Spirit... And when he came, it was an amazing experience. We had some people come to our little group to say things were happening around the country, not a lot, but miraculous things. Christians were taking on a whole new lease of life and would we like to know about it? And we had a debate and to my shame, I argued that the Bible said we have every spiritual blessing in Christ, there isn't anything else. Mim and I were walking home from our evening meeting at Frank's house and she wisely said to me on the way home if there is something with God why don't we just pray and ask God about it so we agreed we'd pray and when we got home we went in the lounge knelt down on the armchair and Mim started to pray now what happened next is something I cannot describe in words adequately And in a sense, it's probably very personal, but it it set something amazing going. And as Mim was praying, and I was kneeling on the other side of the armchair, I started to interrupt her, which it wasn't in the church policy manual that you interrupted someone when they were praying, especially in those days. You could a bit now. And I was not just interrupting, I was being loud. I was saying praise to God and Jesus is great and... She realised and she started joining me. We were singing and clapping and laughing for I don't know how long. And we realised we'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was major. I said, we'd better ring Frank. And we were locking up for the night and we were in the kitchen and the phone rang. And, and we could hear this person laughing down the end of the phone. And uh, it was... Jeff, and he said, Frank, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I can remember Dad's jaw just dropping. And uh, he looked quite crestfallen. And um, he said, well, I think we better go round and see what's going on. And so we hot-footed it round to Mim and Jeff's. And when we got there... They they opened the door and you could tell they were different. They were full of joy and Jeff was just walking around the lounge laughing his head off and they just kept repeating the name of Jesus over and over again. And he came round that evening and several evenings after that to be prayed for, for the Holy Spirit. In the meantime, we found out that the rest of the group, one by one, were being having the similar kind of experience. I was standing one morning, because I worked in London, I was standing on 
um, the platform in Beaconsfield. It was 10 to 7 in the morning. I will never forget it. I had my case by the side of me. The platform was full of people queuing up for the mainline train to go to um, Marlborough. It was 10 to 7 and the Holy Spirit fell on me, baptised me in the Holy Spirit. And I started laughing. And if you can imagine, it was 10 to 7 in the morning and I'm standing on the platform laughing uncontrollably. I couldn't stop laughing. And there's these people looking at me as if I'm mad. I went to school the next day and I can remember it really vividly. I was sitting in a biology lesson and I was wandering and thinking, my mind was wandering about what had happened the night before because it was so different. And uh, as I was thinking about it, I just said very quietly in my head, Lord, if there's anything else and you want to fill me with the Holy Spirit, please do it. Well, then I was just blown away. I could feel bubbles of laughter and, and joy welling up within me. And uh, I kept wanting to giggle, but I realised where I was. And um, every now and then I let out a little giggle and the teacher would look at me. And uh, it was just lovely. All I could think about was Jesus and what he'd done for me. And it was just amazing. We've lived in a period when Grace. the Holy Spirit has been poured out on people many times. Other, other generations live through their whole life without that happening. Looking forward, hoping. Looking forward, yeah. hoping for it. Yeah. Incredible. What were the main three things you liked about church back then? I liked, I liked the fact that we could worship Jesus as we wanted to, especially after we were filled with the Holy Spirit, because there weren't any constraints on us. And it was lovely to be able to worship in the freedom that Jesus gave us. An incredible freedom. There was no formality when we sat down. Not like we have church today, which is formal. We didn't have formal church then. We would sit down. We would wait upon the Lord. We would wait upon the Holy Spirit. And then as we were led by the Holy Spirit, we would speak and we would sing and we would praise the Lord Jesus. The expectancy that something big and new, which we found out was happening in other places in this country and around the world, was happening to the church. And who knows what it was going to be. We felt like Abraham, when he went out, he knew where he'd come from, but he didn't know where he was going. And we were like that. We used to sing a song. It's, we are moving along, Jesus leading the way. It's a way we have never been before. There are mountains to climb, and there were, and there are valleys to cross. But before us, we can see an open door. That's the song. We don't, didn't know what was through the door, but we were going to just keep going. And the, the impetus and the power of that movement wasn't from any of us. It was God has started this. He's going to carry it on. And to this day, he's still carrying it on, and we're still moving along. Did God tell you he was going to make the church grow into what it is today? Um. Well, only that we had words of knowledge where people, one, one day they read from Deuteronomy, and Moses, uh, Moses and Joshua were both promised by God that wherever they, put, wherever they tra trod, that land would become part of um, Israel. And mm. we were told the same thing, wherever you walk, I will give you that land. So we knew he wanted to grow, but we were just living in the now. We were living in the now. Yeah. I don't think we ever had any detail on the vision that God was calling us to. We knew that what we had and what had happened to us was really good and we wanted to share it with everybody we could. And so in that sense, we wanted it to develop. We were ambitious for the kingdom of God. What would you tell people in the church today? What would I say? I would say the thing that we want to take with us is love. There isn't anything greater. There isn't anything that holds people together like love. Receiving love from the Holy Spirit, giving it 
to one another. And then because of that, we can give it outside because it's a picture that God lets us face outwardly so that we can give our love out. And that, that's the thing we need to take with us more than anything yeah. from, from all the past, that's right. the gift of love that he gave us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes people make a lot of the outward signs like tongues. But, you know, Paul said so clearly, above all things, love, and it's costly. Love is costly. It isn't easy, but it is the, the essential thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. I would say that from when we started, we always kept Jesus central. And I, I think that was a very big part of who we are. And I think going forward for the church uh, today, I would say always keep Jesus central. This is so difficult because there's a lot of things you could say, but probably only a few things you should say. Um, we're in a broken world. We're broken people. Things go wrong. Uh, other people will fail you, but worst of all, you will fail you. And so we have to come back to the central person in our lives, in our church, in our country, in the world, the creator of the universe who doesn't fail. And there is forgiveness and mercy and grace. And as Mim said, we keep going. We always come back to him. He understands. So I would say to you, remember that and go for the Holy Spirit's power in your life. Yep. Amen. Good morning, church. Um, you'll be pleased to know that I'm going to be I'm going to be brief this morning, but um, just a quick word, really, to to reflect on on what we've heard, but also to look forward into the future. You know, it was my absolute privilege to get to spend that time with Keith and Di and Jeff and Mim and Joy when they came in to film those interviews that we've just seen and and just hear them tell the story again, each from their own perspective. And we could have been talking for hours and hours. There's such richness and depth to the story of how this church began and the 50 years that have followed. I mean, we've only been able to give you a glimpse, just, just a sense of it this morning. And it is such a great story of God's faithfulness and of what he can do with the obedience of his people, of what he can do with very small beginnings, very small seeds. And that is, of course, the way of God's kingdom. And there are so many people who haven't been mentioned by name, but who have have been a faithful part of that story over many, many years. You, you know who you are. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for the, the battles that you fought and won that have resulted in the church we are today. And indeed, the thousands and thousands of lives that have been impacted and transformed in the process. Mine being one of them. Um, turning up as a, a 17 year old who had been a Christian for a week in 1994 and immediately knowing that I was home, that this was my church. This is where God was calling me to be. And 27 years later, and I can, I can hardly believe that even as I say it, but 27 years later, I get the privilege of being only the third senior pastor of this church after Frank Matthews and Neil Bartlett. Um, and I get the privilege, uh, privilege of leading this, this beautiful and growing family of God into the next chapters of the story. And that's the point. This is an unfinished story. You know, God has done so much uh, in the past, but he's still working in us and he's still working through us. And he will continue to build his church and advance his kingdom. And I've outlined previously the vision that we feel God has given us here at King's which is to be a diverse church of thousands that surrounds and saturates High Wycombe with the love of Jesus. And you can, you can read all about that in this vision booklet. And there's a PDF of this on the vision page on the website. And I, I would really encourage you to have a look at this again. Now, th there's too much in, in there to, to go into now, but I do just want to pick up briefly on something that Jeff said um, that I was particularly struck by. 
He said that in the early days, it was like God opened a door for them and they had to choose to step through it, but not really knowing what was on the other side. And it reminded me, it made me think of Acts chapter 12, where Peter has been imprisoned and we're told that the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And what happens is that an angel comes and releases him from the prison and Peter follows this angel out of the prison. And then verse 10 says that they passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. God opens doors. He opens gates, but we have to see it. We have to be in the right position and to walk through it. And it made me think, well, what is the open door? What's the open gate in front of us right now that God is opening up for us that just takes us the next step into the future that God has for us? Well, I believe that there is a gate that's opening before us. And it's a gate that is both for us to step through as a church into new territory And it's also a gate that opens up to allow others to come in. Now, I outlined this in more detail back in September, but I believe that God is opening a gate for us to step through into more of his power. Supernatural, the supernatural power of God, that we we should have a greater expectation that his spiritual gifts wouldn't just be manifest in the church, but also out on the streets and in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, among our friends, among those who are on our blessed lists that part of serving those on our blessed list would be serving them supernaturally, speaking prophetically that the prophetic word of God into their lives, seeing healing break out, leading people into freedom, being willing to take courageous risks to see God's kingdom advance, that that we would be a people that pursues the supernatural in our everyday lives, to, to pursue it as normal and not just to be open to it, but to be hungry for it to be actively stepping through that gate, to be desperate to see God move. Why? Well, because we have a town to reach. We have a town to surround and saturate with the love of Jesus. And we need the power of God. And uh, next term, we're going to be focusing on that and uh, together taking some steps through that gate. But, you know, even as we step out and make moves towards others, the gate is also opening for people to flood into the church We live in a traumatized society. This last year is going to have a huge impact on mental health and people's well-being for a long time to come. And our response as the church, our response must be love and compassion and welcome. Just like Jesus, who saw the crowds like a sheep without a shepherd and he was moved by compassion for them. So let's be ready to not only go out to where people are, but also for people to come in looking for hope. And, you know, we have hope. We have such great hope to offer the world because we have a saviour who gave everything for us to bring us that hope. Now, why would people turn to the church? Well, there was an article in the Express on the 21st of February and the article had this this headline on it. Covid pandemic brings British churches back to life. And this article was suggesting it had done a poll and it was suggesting that because of how the church has reached out over this last year, loving those who have been struggling, that the percentage of non-Christians who agree that the local church makes a positive difference to their community, that percentage has risen from 20% three years ago to 34% today. That's a huge rise in people feeling favourable towards the church and seeing the church as a place where you are loved and where you get help. So let's be ready, be ready to offer that hope, be ready to offer that help and that support to those who come looking in the days ahead, loving them like Jesus loves them and following his mission to set the captives free, to to have an open gate for people to be able to walk out of the prison and into hope. The gate in Acts 12 opened by itself. God opened that gate for Peter. But you also notice there was something else going on. And that is that the church was praying and they weren't just praying. They were praying earnestly, fervently. And it's a bit like the walls of Jericho. You know, God it's God who brought the walls of Jericho down. But his people also had to do something. They had to march around the city in obedience to God's command. God is opening a gate before us. But he calls us to pray. We must play our part and and we must pray earnestly. 
and we must fast. We've been trying to get into this rhythm of fasting once a month. We must continue to do that fasting and keep on praying until we see breakthrough, until we see that gate fully open, until we see the church, you and me, moving in the power and the authority of Jesus and seeing signs and wonders, seeing healing and freedom break out and the kingdom of God advancing and seeing that gate fully opened up for broken people to come in and find hope and healing in the church. So it is good, it's so good to look back and to celebrate what God has done. It's good to honour those faithful pioneers for their obedience and for their courage. But this church has been full of pioneers for the last 50 years and God is still calling us to pioneer new things. And you may have only been a part of this church for, for just a very short time, but if God is calling you to be here, then the story that has been told today is also your story. You are part of that story and you are part of building on those foundations and pioneering something new in the days ahead. Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter three, he says, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And I believe that God is doing the same for us. And so as we pray together, as we pray for that gate to be flung open, let's be excited. Let's be expectant about all that God has for us in the future. And let's move together to step through that gate together as one. And we're going to worship together now. And, and then Neil, who, who led the church for 26 years, Neil's going to pray for us after that. But first, church, let's worship together. <laughs>